Welcome to Your Space Journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration and the incredible leaders who are taking us there. Here's your host, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks so much for joining me today. NASA's aircraft SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, has confirmed for the first time water on the sunlit surface of the moon. Previously, NASA had discovered evidence for water in shadows of craters, but this new discovery has incredible implications for the possible use of water as a resource as NASA returns to the moon. Joining me today is lunar geologist Dr. Sarah Noble as she discusses this incredible discovery and its implications for the future of space exploration. Your Space Journey Thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate it. Great to be here. We always love to talk to our guests about their space journey, where their passion for space began. I understand you're around 10 years old. You wanted to become an astronaut. Can you tell us just a little bit more about that? What inspired you there? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. It just, it was just one day, it just popped into my head. Oh, maybe I could be an astronaut. And it just sort of stuck. Um, you know, I, I mean, I grew up in rural Minnesota. There was not a lot of you know, space is pre-internet. I'm very old. Um, and, and there wasn't a lot of, you know, space and scientists and, and, and whatnot around me, but I was just, I was fascinated by space. I started to glam onto anything I could find about space, anything I could read about space. Um, managed to go to space camp when I was a teenager, and that sort of really cemented a lot of things for me. So, Now, now Sarah, I love how you had sort of a personal experience with the moon when you are a graduate student. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. I, I was working late in the lab one night, um, working on some lunar samples, uh, some lunar soils, and, and I, was, I was walking home from, from the lab, and it was a full moon, and the moon was shining down. I looked down at my hands, and they were sort of sparkly, and a few grains of lunar soil wow. sparkling on, on my hands, and I looked at my hands and up at the moon, and like, this dirt came from there, and like, I had this like epiphany about the moon as, as this geologic place that's you know not just you know, up in the sky, but it's a place with rocks and dirt and like a place we've been and can go back to. And it was just a, a real moment. Now that had to be surreal with the, with the recent announcement this week of the discovery of water on the sunlit areas of the moon that had to mean a lot to you. I'd like to get into a little bit more. Uh, I understand that was uh, made possible by Sophia. And for our audience out there who doesn't know what Sophia is, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, SOFIA is an airborne observatory. We actually took a plane and like ripped the side out of it and put a telescope in there. And we can go and fly up sort of above the atmosphere, m much of the atmosphere, um, and use it as a, as a telescope. Um, the, the measurement that, that, you know, that they took for this, this paper that came out this week is actually really incredible. They'd never tried to use SOFIA to look at the moon before. Yeah. It's really hard, right? If you've right. ever looked at, at the moon through a regular telescope in your backyard, right, it's it moves, right? Over the course of the evening, it moves pretty quickly, right? And it, you know, compared to the most of the things that Sophia is looking at, which are, you know, very distant galaxies and whatnot, right? It, it moves to the sky. And remember, Sophia is also moving too, right? It's a plane. Yes. Uh, and so, so ma you know, managing to, to coordinate all of that movement and, and still train your, your, your focus on that very small part of the moon is, is actually quite, quite an achievement. And, and they've never tried it before. So, uh, you know, this graduate student at the time, Casey, the, the, the lead author of the paper, was like, well, we, can't we do this? And, and, and the, she put in an application to get some time on the telescope. They actually rejected it the first time. Really? Uh, she tried again, and, and the, the director of Sophia was like, well, you know, let's try this. We may as well give it a try, and gave her some of what's called d director's discretionary time. It's, hmm. it's a little bit of extra time that the director gets to, you know, sort of make their own decisions about things. Sure. And so they thought, well, we'll do it. We'll do this test. And, and that's the, the results that, that came out this week was just that test. Now, they, they only did this one test, right? They'll be doing follow-ups now to sort of look at more of the moon now that we know that we can do that measurement. What an incredible accomplishment. Now, now obviously, before we, we've uh, discovered, we believe, water ice is at the south surface of the moon. Um, but this discovery is saying it's sunlit area, it's, it's Clavius, which is a crater visible to all of us uh, when the moon is visible at that particular phase. But I understand that they found basically the equivalent of a 12-ounce bottle, bottle of water in sort of a cubic meter. So roughly 30 square feet, you get a, a bottle of water. Not much, but it's still an amount. Can you tell us just a bit more about that? 
Yeah, it's it's a very tiny amount. And to and to be clear, the measurement they're looking at actually only looks at the very uppermost surface, right? Ah. So they're not seeing down a meter. They're guessing Good about, point. well, if there's this much at the surface, we think there might be this much deeper down. But really okay. the measurement is only measuring the, the very surface hmm. uh, skin of the of the moon. And it is a very tiny amount. Um so you know, people talk about being used as a resource, and I and I I personally think it'll be very difficult to get that that kind of of, of water out. I mean, it is it is literally a hundred times drier than the driest deserts here on Earth, right? So it's wow. a very tiny amount of water, uh, but doesn't mean it isn't isn't useful, right? It tells us about water, about how water is being formed and moved around on the moon, and that can help us identify where the where the water resources are and understand how water the water works on the moon, and that will help us uh, evaluate resources. Seth, so that's incredible. Now, the other thing I heard, too, is that um, other spacecraft have hinted that there was uh, water on the moon or possibly not HCO but hydroxyl. And can you just tell what is what is hydroxyl? So hydroxyl is is OH as opposed to you know water is H two O, and a lot of our previous measurements uh, from orbit at the moon have has sort of looked in the, the the three micron part of the wavelength right where there's a band that that is sort of overlapping where OH and water both have bands. Mm-hmm. This measurement Sophia looks out at longer. It looks out at at six. Six microns, six point one microns, where there's a band that is only due to water. There isn't an OH band there, and so we can say definitively now that the bands that we had, the hints that we had seen earlier of, of OH and water, and there's probably both there, OH and water, um, but we couldn't untangle them. Mm-hmm. But we can say definitively now from these Sophia measurements that that it is in fact H two O and not just OH. Are there any? What are the current theories going on for how? on earth or how on moon, I should say <laughs> waters on the moon. How, how did it get there? Any ideas? Yeah. So there's a couple of ways that we can do it. Um, uh, so you can get, so first of all, the, the sun, the solar wind is constantly supplying hydrogen to the moon, right? Mm-hmm. Solar wind brings hydrogen to the moon. The rocks, of the moon it's themselves are about 40% oxygen. And so uh, there are ways that you can sort of bring this hydrogen in and combine it with the oxygen, particularly when you get micrometeorites coming in and they generate a lot of heat and energy. Uh, and so you can find ways to, to combine the, the oxygen and the hydrogen. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the micrometeorites as well also bring in water themselves, right? They, they um, are hydrated, some of them, and so they are also bringing in water. We don't know where that water is co- going and how easily it is captured and, and lost. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also, you know, larger thing, you know, larger meteorites, comets um, that occasionally hit the moon, and we think that water can sort of bounce around and maybe find it a place to get trapped. Uh, and then there's the original water that the moon probably had at some level uh, back in its early history, right? So when there were the, you know, three billion years ago when there were still volcanoes active on the moon, that was probably bringing some amount of, of water and volatiles up as well. Now, as a, as a lunar geologist, uh, I guess personally, what excites you the most about this particular discovery? Um, I, you know, I think it's great. I, mean, I look back at, you know, my, my career, when, when I started studying the moon, we thought the moon was completely dry. No water on the moon. That's ridiculous. The right. moon is completely dry. You know, the way that it was formed, you know, this hot impact with, with you know, when the Earth was impacted by this large Mars-sized object and, yeah. and it generated the moon and it was hot and violent and all that water was lost and the moon is completely dry. There's no, there's no water in the moon. That's ridiculous. And then uh, over the course of my career, we have been, we've been, we've, I don't know how many times now we have found water on the moon. Over and over again, we keep finding that the moon is this much more uh, geologically active place than we, than we had assumed. Um, and so I, you know, I think, you know, as the story is still unraveling and we are learning more and more about the water cycle on the moon, the fact that I'm talking about a water cycle on the moon, it, you know, Perhaps past me would be just incredulous that I would sit here and talk about a water cycle on the moon. But I, I think it's great that we keep getting these these little hints and pieces of how this puzzle fits together. And I'm, you know, I'm excited the next few years are going to be a really exciting time at NASA yeah. uh, for the lunar scientists, right? We are, we are sending a lot of stuff towards the moon. Uh, and a lot of it is focused on understanding this water cycle. So we've got some uh, commercial landers that are, that are going to land some instruments um, near the poles uh, fairly soon. Uh, and then there's the, the Viper rover, which I'm the program scientist for the Viper rover, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, oh, wow. uh, which is very specifically designed to, to sort of explore some of these regions at the poles where we think that there's a lot of water 
Uh, and to understand those resources, it's got a drill. We can drill down and see see how, how the water is distributed at depth. Wow. Uh, so that's really exciting. And then, of course, you know, the Artemis program, we're going to send humans. Humans are, are fantastic geologists uh, and will, will help us bring back some of those samples so we can really dig down and, and understand these cycles. That's incredible. What, what is the timeline for Viper? Uh, let's see. So Viper is to launch in 2020. I should know this. It's my mission. 2023? <laughs> <laughs> Things change so constantly in this, <laughs> but but it is coming. So I was going to ask you, like, what what is what is next? So I mean, that's it's just exciting. I didn't realize uh, that Viper was coming in the next couple of years, and, and and you're right with Artemis uh, returning the first woman and the next man to the moon. I think that's going to be incredible on in that. Um, I, I I do want to ask you though. I you you're an incredible artist, and I I had come across some of your beautiful space art. I just want to tell us a little bit more about your space art. And what inspired you to um, not only be you know geologist, but also be an incredible artist? Yeah, you know I I you know it, it's funny. People always ask, oh, it's you're a scientist and an artist. Like I don't understand, and I and I always think that's really funny because right, they're both the same thing. They're both creative problem solving, right? right. Uh, and in fact, there are a lot of us. If you look around, you know, the science that are that are also artists and musicians and poets, and we all, I think, we all need to use both sides of our brains, and and it's a great outlet. But for me, I, you know, I just feel like the the you know the moon and and space is just such an incredibly beautiful place, and and um, I'm much better with paint than I am with words, and so I, I, you know, I understand. I just like to like to express that um, and show the world how how gorgeous the solar system is. Oh, it is beautiful, and your artwork is amazing. Um, just one last thing, too. A lot of people out there are very inspired. When maybe they have kids that are they're uh, expressing interest in space. You know, maybe they're ten years old. They want to become an astronaut. What advice would you, would you give the kids or the parents out there of those kids? Yeah, you know what? There, there's a, it is an exciting time for NASA. We are we are looking to go back to the moon and to Mars and and to you know start exploring more of the the solar system. Um, and I I think. You know, my advice for any kid is to like follow the things you're passionate about, right? There is there is room at NASA for everybody. We have we have scientists, we have engineers, but we also have you know uh, budget people, and we have artists, and we have communications experts, and and you know there is literally a, a job for everybody at NASA. And so, uh, if you want to be part of this adventure, you know, follow your passions and and join us in whatever way your talents provide. Oh, wonderful. Sarah, again, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time today to tell us about this incredible discovery. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Your Space Journey. Wow, what an incredible discovery of NASA. Next time you look at the moon at night, you can look up and actually see that the moon is no longer just a dry, barren, dead surface. It actually has water. Now, of course, not puddles or lakes, but again, the possibility of extracting water for future space missions. For me personally, I think that's incredible. If you'd like to learn more, just go to nasa.gov forward slash Sophia. That's S-O-F-I-A. I want to thank Sarah for joining me today to discuss this incredible discovery. I want to thank you for joining us as well. Again, we'd love it if you just share this episode with a friend. Also, if you can give us a like or a thumbs up if you're watching YouTube, we'd appreciate that too. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. God bless.